Hey, it's me, Nalthazar, and welcome to another video. In this one, I'm going to be going over which of the masterpieces that are coming to us in M21 do I value as chase cards. So which are the ones that I'm going to be going for first? I'll highlight the ones that I think are absolutely the best of the best, the cream of the crop, the ones that you are going to want to target with your pinkies um, at first, and then just the other ones are all ones that I think are worth having. So let's just go ahead and start taking a look at them. So uh, actually, no, one more thing, sorry. Uh, I'm doing this as masterpieces. I've broken up the videos into masterpieces, mythics, rares, and then commons, uncommons. This is just because I've put out a lot of lengthier videos lately with me putting up the tier lists and the state of the game and the patch notes and the planeswalkers. So I wanted to make just a few like quickies for you guys so that you could just sort of like, you know, watch like a video that's not as long. So yeah, now we're getting into it for real. So uh, the first of these masterpieces is Avatar of Growth. Uh, just off the bat, I think that this is uh, one of the ones that you should absolutely target immediately with your pinkies. Uh, so Avatar of Growth is 16 for a 7-7. Seven, seven. It's an elemental. And when this creature enters the battlefield, convert X gems to green. X is your green mana bonus. So this is going to be particularly good in any Planeswalkers deck that has a high green mana bonus. Um, a Planeswalker like Kiora or Brokon won't be quite as good just because it's only going to convert three gems to green. Uh, but that's not to say that it won't be very powerful in that deck. Now you then fetch the first two land supports from your library and move those to the board under your control. This is a card that's going to be an absolute monster in both Standard and in Legacy. Because in Legacy, if you're running a Rupture Spire deck, playing this thing is going to convert gems to green, and then it's going to fetch two Rupture Spires and put them directly down. Uh, so if you're, run if you're running this, say, in Brocon, then... Uh, I would imagine you'll probably be able to use your third ability almost every single turn just because of this, if not actually every single turn. Because once you use it once, this thing's converting things to green, and then the Rupture Spires come down. In converting things to green, that means it's guaranteeing that the Rupture Spire is going to have targets to destroy. Uh, in standard, this thing is going to be an absolute boss, like just completely deadly. Um, you can run this with gates. You could actually make an incredible gate deck with this just with fetching those supports from your library. Uh, you can do a whole bunch of wacky things using this avatar of growth. Uh, I, I can't wait to try this one out. This one is one that you absolutely are going to want to get your hands on immediately. The next one on the list is Bone Miser. Bone Miser is more of a like strong card that could be really strong or it could just be kind of a niche cool card. So it's very similar to Surly Badger Soar from Ikoria in that it has the whenever you cycle or discard another card, these three things happen, uh, or one of these three things happen. So if that card is a creature, you create two zombie tokens. Those tokens are going to be two twos, so you make a uh, four four zombie. If that card is a land, you convert two gems to black. And if that card is a non-creature, non-land card, so a spell, basically, uh, you draw a card. There are a whole bunch of things that are going to make you discard a ton of cards and then draw a bunch of cards and then discard cards and draw cards. So uh, if you pair Bone Miser with, say, Song of Creation, I mean, that could be a really nasty combo. You then throw in something like Dragon Mage to the deck also, and voila, now you're going to be discarding so many cards. So there are some pretty wacky things you can do with this. I'm really excited to give it a shot and see if it's like busted broken or if it's just like crazy strong. The next card is Chainer Nightmare Adept. And when I actually first looked at this one, I was kind of like, meh. And then I read the bottom ability and I was like, oh, but but that, yeah, that that's a thing, right? So this is a 6-5 for 13. At the beginning of your turn, you may discard the first card from your hand. If you do, the first creature in your graveyard gains buried equal to its mana cost. Gain X mana. X is the amount of mana in the card discarded this way. Now, I don't particularly like that first ability much at first sight just because I have to discard something. And I mean, it does... I do gain the mana, right? Um, but... Uh, I don't know. I don't like the idea of discarding my first card. I'll have to test that. It's the bottom bit that makes this good, though. So when a creature enters the battlefield from your graveyard, that creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains haste. Then create up to three graveyard gems. So there are currently a bunch of cards that are going to bring creatures back from your graveyard. Just singular, plural, however you want to see it. But now you bring it back, and that creature is going to get plus three, plus three, and it's going to get haste, uh, which is not a 
uh, which is which is not it's not an evergreen I suppose haste isn't an evergreen but it's not an ability that black typically has uh, and so you can put this in a black deck then uh, say uh, Liliana dump eight cards into your graveyard and then play Eerie Ultimatum you're going to bring them all back and now they're also going to have haste on top of all the other shenanigans that you're going to be able to do with it. So there's there's some pretty wicked stuff with this. Furthermore, it says whenever it enters the battlefield from your graveyard, so something like Garuda's uh, companion ability is going to work for this too. Uh, I mean, there's, there's just so much that you could do with this ability and just get so much power out of it that I'm really excited to give this one a shot and tinker with it. Next card is Elsha of the Infinite. So Elsha of the Infinite doesn't look great at first, but then you realize what Prowess does and you go, oh, oh yeah, no, that's actually kind of good, right? So it's 15 for a 5-5. Five, five. It has Prowess, which means whenever you cast a non-creature card, this ability happens. And it's not limited to like two, three times a turn. It's just this ability happens every time. So uh, those of you who have made loop decks or you've made like Thousand Year Storm decks or really like there, there's so many combinations that you could do to play a ton of spells. Well, this thing is going to be a complete boss with them because this creature gets plus four, plus four until end of turn. Then draw a card. If that card is a non-creature card, it gains flash. So basically with this, right, you could play green gem conversion, which there's a heck of a lot of right now, right? And then this creature is going to get plus four, plus four, and then you're going to draw a card. So it's going to be kind of like a Barl, right? Except, or a Rashmi in a way, in that like, you're going to be able to draw and draw and draw and draw. And then uh, it also has the bottom ability. When you cast a card during your opponent's turn, this creature gets plus two, plus two. They're reworking Flash, so I'm really excited to see what that turns out to be. But even without the reworked Flash, even without that bottom ability, just this top ability is going to be crazy. You throw in, say, Cultivate, which is a new card in this set. You throw in, oh, um, Omen of the Hunt. You throw in, like, there's so many things that you can throw in that produce mana right now that... Uh, I could easily see you getting five, six triggers of prowess on an easy turn, uh, and that's going to be plus 20 or more power to this creature. So uh, I could see this being pretty good, Just not just the power boost, but the card draw is fantastic. I throw in Whirlwind of Thought, oh man, there's so much you can do. Like this, this is going to be a nasty, dirty, dirty one. Next one up is Goblin Goliath. Goblin Goliath is a sweetie. I absolutely love goblins. Goblins are my favorite tribe in Magic. And uh, this particular goblin is going to be a filth mongrel. So it's 19 mana for an 8-7. It has haste, so it's coming out swinging. When this creature enters the battlefield, create X goblin tokens where X is your red mana bonus. So let's say that you throw this in Koth. Then you get 9 goblin tokens on top of getting the goliath just for this thing entering the battlefield if you run this with the new snoop card like that like snoop goblin or whatever or i think what he's gone from snoop lion to snoop goblin i don't know whatever snoop goblin covetous snoop is that it i think so whatever you're gonna see an image of it on the screen so we're good uh, but that thing makes it so that you can exile the last creature from your hand if it's a goblin and then put a copy of it on the battlefield uh, and then return that exiled card to your hand. So uh, you could just keep popping Goblin Goliaths onto the battlefield every turn for nine Goblin Tokens in a Koth deck, which is terrifying. Uh, if you're running this with, say, Papa Kranko, then, oh my goodness, right? Like, oi, terrifying. So many Goblins, so many Goblins. This is beautiful. And then not only that, but you activate uh, two two turn red gems, which means that uh, you're going to be popping those, but if you don't pop one on one turn, you're going to get it on the next turn, and your creatures gain double strike until end of turn, and then gain two goblin tokens. So not only with, let's say, Koth, because uh, Koth is the baby that I'm talking about here, are you getting those nine tokens, but you activate those red things, and even if you just activate one of them, then now you've got an 11-11, and it's got double strike. The Goliath has double strike. And so now this thing is 38 power for 19, uh, super easy peasy out the gate. So there's a lot of really scary things you can do with this card, especially because it's just when this creature enters the battlefield to create those tokens. Uh, this thing's going to be an absolute terror with Killer Instinct until Killer Instinct exits standard. And even when it does, I mean, this thing is going to be... This thing's going to be scary, guys. This is a really, really good card. 
Then we've got Grimm's Mold, the Dread Sour. This is not one that you need to immediately target with your pinkies like the first Elemental was. And actually, I would say that Goblin Goliath is one that you should absolutely target early on with your pinkies also, especially if you're someone who enjoys playing with Koth. If you're not someone who enjoys playing with Koth or other Red Walkers that have a high red bonus, you don't need to, but uh, Grimm's Mold. Grimm's Mold isn't like them. Uh, Grimm's Mold is 14 for a 6-6. Six, six. It's got Trample, and when a creature dies or loses a reinforcement, this creature gets plus 2, plus 2. If that creature is a token, this gets plus 3, plus 3 instead. It also has, at the end of your turn, create two Sapperling tokens under each player's control, and Morbid, if something died this turn or lost a reinforcement, then you gain three life. So this is going to be fantastic because it's going to put a token into play under your opponent's control every turn. And it's already a solid creature on its own. So it's it's already good by itself, but then you throw in that you're giving stuff to your opponent too. And that's going to be fantastic for destroying opponent creature objectives. Because sometimes you just run up against a creatureless deck and you're like, darn, I just lost this objective. This dude makes it so that that's not going to happen. And instead of having to worry about something like Dowsing Dagger, where you're like, uh, I need to actually draw a few of these. No, you just need this dude. And this dude's going to make those tokens every single turn. And he's a solid creature even without that. So really, really cool. You run this thing with uh, the Fungus Leader, um, who already has something that makes him lose reinforcements himself. Uh, and this dude's going to get powered up. He's going to make Sapperling tokens, which is going to make the Fungus Leader become a boss. Uh, there's a whole bunch of nasty stuff with Grimm's Mold that you can do. I know that that's legacy, but even in standard, just for objectives, this will be a good card to have. It's not one that you necessarily need to spend all your pinkies for to get right away. Uh, but if you do wind up getting lucky and you do get this card, this will be a very good card to have in your collection. Then we've got Marisi, Breaker of the Coil. So Marisi, Breaker of the Coil is a little bit of a funky creature, but I still really like it. So it's 13 for a 7-6, which is actually a very reasonable power toughness for 13. It has uh, the, the new mechanic that makes it so that it can go into the first position. I don't think it's called leader. Um, I'm drawing a blank now. I got like three hours of sleep last night. But it's the little banneret at the bottom of him next to the legendary symbol. Uh, bravery, that's what it's called. Yes, not leader. Bravery, cool. Yes. So, while on the battlefield, your opponent can't cast cards during your turn. This isn't a big deal right now, but once again, they're retooling Flash, and when Flash gets retooled, if it's like anything like how instants work in Magic, or how it works in Arena, or something like that, uh, then having this card is going to be very, very good to have. And then it also has, when this creature deals combat damage to your opponent's Planeswalker, the first opposing creature with the least power among creatures your opponent controls, gains Berserker and Bravery until the beginning of your next turn, meaning that you're going to make all of your opponent's weakest creatures, really all of them, but just specifically the weakest ones first, get Berserker and go into that first slot, meaning that they're going to be attacking first, meaning that you're going to be able to more likely kill all of your opponent's creatures. So this thing has a solid body. Um, it has the ability to get rid of your opponent's creatures by making them attack you, and it also has uh, your opponents can't play cards with Flash. It's once again not a card that you need to target immediately with your pinkies, but if you get it, it's definitely a really good card. This brings us to Militant Angel. Militant Angel is 22 for a 6-7 with lifelink and uh, I was gonna, bravery, uh, so it's going to move to the bottom uh, or to your first creature slot when your combat starts. When this creature enters the battlefield, you gain X life and create X knight tokens. X is your white mana bonus. Knight tokens have typically been 2-2 Vigilance tokens, so my guess is that if you're playing this with any white Planeswalker that has a reasonable uh, white mana bonus, you're going to be getting a whole bunch of 2-2 Vigilant Knight tokens, which is pretty sweet, especially because it's when this enters the battlefield. So if you flicker it, you get more tokens and more life. If you've got Killer Instinct or something like that down where you're able to just get more of these things going, uh, eerie ultimatum, some way of bringing it back from the graveyard, whatever it may be, this is going to make those knight tokens. If you're running it in, say, Elspeth, Sun's Champion, she's got a white mana bonus of plus seven, which means that you are going to be getting seven knight tokens, which means that you're going to be getting a 14-14 Vigilance and a 6-7 Flying Life Link, and um, that's not leader, shame on you, Bravery. So uh, that already is solid. And on top of that, it has, when this creature attacks, gain three life and create a knight token. So those knight tokens that you're going to be making, you're going to get a lot of them. 
Um, this is a solid card. It's once again, not a card that you need to jump out and spend all of your crystals for to try getting immediately. But if you do get it, it'll be a very powerful card in your collection. Um, very, very much so worth it. This brings us to Rot Hulk. Rot Hulk is 20 for an 8 8 zombie. It has menace and has a really beautiful slash ugly face. I don't know. It's a horrifying creature. Also, how long is its right leg if its left leg is like standing on what appears to be water? I don't know if that. What? I, I'm confused by the picture. Whatever. Nonetheless, this thing is a savage beast. So when this creature enters the battlefield, which means that it triggers coming back from your graveyard, your opponent loses X life, where X is your black mana bonus. Then return the first two different zombie creatures that are not named Rot Hulk from your graveyard to the battlefield under your control. There are some really nasty zombies that are coming out in this set. There are a whole bunch of ways that we can throw things in our graveyard. And so this dude, when it comes back into the battlefield, it makes it so that your opponent loses life and you get two more free creatures. So not only are you getting this 8-8, but you're getting two more creatures from the graveyard. This dude gives crazy card advantage and is really, really strong. If you use this once again, same Liliana at the beginning, uh, the one who dumps eight. I always call her Death's Majesty, but I know that that's not which one it is. Maybe it's like something by death, Liliana untouched by death or something like that. You'll see here on the screen, so. Uh, but you you have a mana bonus of seven, so your opponent's gonna lose seven life, and then you return the first two different zombie creatures that are not named Rot Hulk from your graveyard to the battlefield. So uh, this thing is, is absolutely terrifying, very, very strong creature. Um, if you want for additional hijinks, you could actually use Liliana Death's Majesty. You use her first ability um, to make it so that you lose a creature and bring it back. It's now going to become a zombie subtype, which means that then if it dies, Rot Hulk is actually going to be able to bring that creature back. So there's a whole bunch of crazy things you can do with this card. I really like it. It is one that is worth using pinkies on, but it's it's definitely not as good as the initial elemental or even to me as the, the goblin um, face masher. And then Volrath, Volrath the Shape Stealer, Volrath the Terrifying. Volrath is 21 for a 7-5 with Mutate. So Mutate is a new mechanic introduced in Ikoria. Uh, mutation, a target opposing creature gets minus one, minus one. Then this creature gains a random basic evergreen ability. So gaining a random basic evergreen is kind of cool. You could get lucky, get lifelink, double strike, one of those types of things. Uh, or you could just wind up getting something like Trample or Vigilance or Flying or something, which is going to be, you know, like they're good mechanics, but whatever. Uh, but the real power of this card is when this creature is cast as a mutation, the mutated creature's base power and toughness becomes 7-5. So if you take something that is, say, a leader, and then that leader you're just pumping out tokens for, most of the leaders have like a power toughness of like 2-2 two, two or something. They're not very strong, maybe 3-2. Uh, but this thing's going to make it so that there's 7-5. Or even if you have a creature that's able to reinforce itself a whole ton of times, uh, this thing is going to make that creature get really big really, really fast. So you can do some pretty wacky things with critters that are going to reinforce. Um, there's a new Falcon Wrath Vampire that is able to reinforce itself a whole bunch of times based on discarding cards. You put this thing on it, and now it's reinforcing at 7-5 instead of at 3-4. So uh, Volrath has some very, very, very nice potential to do some horrible things to your opponents. Now, that's all of my masterpieces that I have on my chase list. Uh, if I missed one of your favorites that you saw, I'm sorry. These are just the ones that stood out to me as the ones that I think are going to be the best. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.